of uh, mass peace action. And for those of you that uh, are not aware of mass peace action, I just want to say a couple of things. Um, if you look at their website, Mass Peace Action is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization working to develop sustainable political power to foster a more just and peaceful U.S. foreign policy. And this is through gra grassroots organizing, policy advocacy, and community education. We promote human rights and global cooperation, seek to end war, and spread of nuclear weapons, support budget priorities that redirect excessive military spending to meet human and environmental needs in our communities. And I think I think it's that's that's important to uh, to mention that it, it's a great group i've been a part of it for a number of years not as active as perhaps i should have been but um i just want you to make it all aware of it and to uh, look at this website and maybe join all right um tonight um our topic is um nagora karabakh and um many americans are not aware of nagora karabakh and they know little about it but it, unless you, if you're an Armenian uh, American or an Azeri American, you, you do know something about it. Tonight's discussion will hopefully give you a better understanding of not only the background to the conflict, but what is going on right now. As much as this conflict, conflict is distant, there are potential issues for the United States. One is that although the war right now is limited between Azerbaijan and, the, and Armenia and Karabakh, each reg respectively supported by Turkey and Armenia, there's a chance that if it's not stopped, the war could escalate into a regional conflict. Also, this war highlights the terrible trade by world powers in the weapons of war, and I think that will be shown during the presentation. The United States is the largest supplier of weapons around the world, and I think we should all be aware of that and be cognizant of the fact that we, we do supply uh, weapons of mass destruction. Lastly, the fighting is the cause of thousands of soldiers and citizens deaths and the destruction of homes on both sides. And if allowed to continue, there is fear it could get much worse. So um, in order to enlighten us, there'll be a two part, well, actually three part program tonight. One will be the, uh, the, the uh, history of Nagora Karabakh, the issues of Nagora Karabakh. And the second will be the um, uh, present day situation. And lastly, um, assuming there'll be time, we'll open up to questions. The, um, Background to Nagora Karabakh will be uh, by Arm Arkun. Arkun. Um, he is a scholar. He is, he's uh, a, a graduate of uh, Princeton, uh, University of Pennsylvania, and UCLA. He's taught at New York University, UCLA, and University of Michigan, and Ann Arbor. He is also a fluent in obviously English, but Armenian, French, and Turkish. And so I'm going to turn this program over to Arm, Arm right now, and he'll give us the background to um, the, the situation. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you uh, for hosting this evening. And um, secondly, you already did such a good job of introducing some of the broader issues that I can save myself a couple of minutes on that. I'm going to put on my PowerPoint and I'm going to now make it into a real slideshow. And uh, it's a beautiful country. You can see it's mostly mountainous and Karabakh, what we call Nagorno-Karabakh is probably, they say around 4,400 uh, square kilometers or something uh, around the size of uh, uh, Delaware in between Rhode Island and Delaware basically. And uh, on the surface it, you know, maybe most people haven't paid much attention to it who are not involved in, in these kinds of international affairs or have any connection with the region. Uh, and there is at present uh, sort of a, a, a war going on. Uh, the red area that you see on this map is the uh, an area that we're going to be talking about. It's uh, was. Hold uh, on, we're not seeing the map. We're just seeing your face. Oh. Uh, let me hold on. Let me. Did you let me try something again? Maybe I didn't put the share properly. One second. Uh, okay. Now, do you think the spotlight might be causing it, Brian? How about uh, now? There you yeah, go. that's better. Now we see the green trees. Okay, one second. Oh, okay, I think. All right, is it now full screen? Hopefully. Yes. Okay. Yes. So now you see the map. Okay. So yes. Basically, uh, the 
this area in red is uh, we're going to talk about a little later uh, a part that uh, autonomous uh, oblast or region within Azerbaijan uh, during the period of the Soviet Union. And the area in brown is actually area that is uh, under control of uh, Armenians in this region. Next to it is a small Republic of Armenia. Next to it is Turkey. Underneath it is Iran. And this is a broader perspective map. You can see that uh, there are a lot of countries in this area, but the big powers are the Russian Federation, Turkey, and Iran uh, in this uh, region. There are regional and global uh, powers. And in fact, Turkey will talk about its involvement in, in the conflict over the centuries, in fact, uh, is blocked by Southern Armenia and Karabakh, basically to uniting with Azerbaijan and, and from there having access to uh, Central Asia. So um, this territory that we're talking about, the area uh, that we call Nagorno-Karabakh, we go back several thousand years. Uh, uh, we know that um, this is an area that was part of historic Armenia. We know before that there was a, a, a country called Urartu uh, in that area and from the 9th to 6th century BC. And the ruins that I show you are from the 1st century and they're from a city called uh, Tigranakert or built by Tigran. And this, this is a city that was known about historically but was on, the ruins of it were only discovered in, I think, about 2005. And it's sort of, I guess you would say, Roman era. But it's a, a, a part, it shows it's from a period of time when this area was, again, part of broader Armenia. And the people living there from the, uh, let's say, second to first centuries BC were already part of uh, larger Armenia historically and were speaking Armenian and um, over uh, and went through all the, the vicissitudes that the people living in this highland plateau did. Armenia is a crossroads and has been a crossroads for several millennia and the people here were no exception and sometimes Armenia was occupied by various invaders, sometimes it had periods of independence. So uh, there were Armenian, uh, large Armenian kingdoms uh, ruled by after this particular dynasty and the uh, next one is called the Arshaguni uh, dynasty. But Armenia was divided in the fourth century between Byzantium and uh, Persia. And at that time, our parts of Armenia were split off and the Persians made uh, this area that we're talking about today, Karabakh, part of uh, a, a different uh, administrative unit. Uh, we don't have time to go into all the details, but uh, despite all the changes of borders and things, Karabakh or the people living there participate in a lot of the same cultural developments as Armenia did. So Karabakh became Christian along with uh, the rest of Armenia. You see in this slide uh, a um, image of uh, uh, which is in a fifth century chapel of Saint uh, Krikoris, who was the grandson of of uh, Saint Gregory the Illuminator, who was the guy who Christianized. Armenia, and this guy ended up being killed and, and buried in, in this uh, chapel. The fifth century chapel is beneath this newer uh, church. Uh, but the point is that uh, from an early period, the Armenians living in, in this region had become Christian. This is a broader picture of historical Armenia. And the, there are three, uh, the northeasternmost provinces I want to call your attention to called Utik, uh, Artsakh and Sunik. And today's Karabakh, what we call Karabakh, is largely composed of that area called Artsakh. And uh, Artsakh is a word that probably has roots in the Ur Urartian language. Uh, and they're small bits of the two other provinces. And so I want to point out that what we call Karabakh, the name itself is not Armenian name. It's a relatively recent name that started to be used in late medieval times, and it's a hybrid name. The Russians added Nagorno to it. So when you see Nagorno-Karabakh, Nagorno means mountainous. Karabakh, most people say, comes from two words, Kara meaning black uh, in Turkish or Turkic languages, and Bah meaning garden in uh, Persian. There are several other 
possible interpretation. Those are, again, those two uh, provinces in medieval times. And this area uh, basically had uh, been split off. Armenia lost its independence. It gained independence again uh, after the Persians and the Byzantines were weakened. The Arabs came into this region and uh, initially they were very powerful and they conquered this whole area. But as they grew weaker, all the peoples in, in the Caucasus, as well as much of the Near East tried to get their independence and Armenia established a, a, a kingdom. And in this kingdom, this area, I don't know if you see the arrow, but uh, this Indi area called Artsakh, it's spelled German, German way with a Z, uh, was, was part of it. And uh, it had independent or semi-independent rulers under an Armenian uh, uh, monarch. And as those, as the monarchy again grew weak, there were invasions again, this time from uh, Central Asia uh, and from the East, there were Turkic people, Seljuk Turks and others. And at this time, you know, this kingdom disintegrate into small principalities. And eventually most of it was conquered first by the Byzantines and then by the Seljuk Turks. But there was a small uh, area which retained its independence. And that's the area we're talking about because it was so mountainous, so difficult of access. So we ended up with a kingdom that was called Hachen. Uh, and this church here is uh, one of the jewels of the architecture of this period. It's from the 13th century. And it was established by a Prince ha Hassan Jalal Daula. Now, this is interesting that his name sounds very Arabic or Muslim, but actually for several centuries, many Armenians, especially nobles or rulers used uh, those kind of names. And many churches- Arm, arm excuse me. Um, we, we, don't want, we don't want, we want to try to make sure this is within the hour. So could we try to wrap this up yes. within uh, seven or eight minutes? Sure. Thank you. Um, in this guy had connections with the Mongols and so forth, but after uh, the Mongol and invasions, uh, the territory had more Turkic peoples come in, and uh, only uh, five small principalities remained. You can see them here, and I'm going to show you another map, but the names are clear Gulistan, Chiraper, Pacha, and that's just a small part of the historic one, Varand and Tizak. And these areas were ruled by people who are called Meliks or princes. They managed to keep their independence because they had fortresses like this. This is all the way in the north in Gulistan. Uh, this is another one from, uh, I believe, the seventh century. It's on the conflux of two rivers, Tartar and uh, Tahri, and it's very hard to access because it's on a ravine and you can only get it from in from one side. Here's another, the, ra uh, the ruins you can see all the way on the right. This is Kansasar, that's opposite that previous uh, fortress. This is the 18th century uh, uh, walls of Shushi, which are like t uh, over 20 uh, feet high, massive. Um, here's one more. And this is one of the palaces, of course, in ruins now that one of those Meliks or princes lived. So after the rest of Armenia lost its independence, this region came under uh, Persian rule. It was, uh, it, the Armenians there were known as fierce warriors. It's a mountainous area, hard of access. So up until the 18th century, they kept their independence. But uh, uh, in this area, it was almost completely Armenian, but the lowlands area, which is kind of, the to the east of that area uh, started to be populated by nom semi-nomadic uh, Turkic and Kurdish people who uh, grazed their uh, their cattle and animals uh, mostly in the plains but went into the mountains. So this is the first beginning of change of demography of the area. The Russians came to the area in the beginning of the 19th century. They added this area to the yellow province Elizabeth Pole which was separate from where most Armenians lived, which was the reddish purple province of, of uh, Yerevan next to it. So in the Russian period uh, that established some peace uh, in the area was uh, basically constant warfare. So for about almost a hundred years, uh, it was relatively peaceful, but at the end of the period, the Russian empire was weak and the neighboring Ottoman empire itself was uh, experiencing turmoil. And there were massacres of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire that led to 
uh, some Armenian nationalism. And um, this area by World War I, uh, the area that we're talking about was perhaps like about 95% Armenian, the mountainous area, but the areas to the east, the plains areas were mostly uh, Kurdish and Turkish and, and Muslim. So during World War I, you know about the Armenian genocide, uh, the Ottoman Empire, not just attempted to kill Armenians living within its territories, but it went into the Caucasus and had an army that went all the way through Baku. And that army also stopped in Shushi or Shusha, which was uh, one of the main cities of the Caucasus where it was half and half Armenian and, and uh, Turkic population. And it basically tried to uh, create a, 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 a state and support the Azerbaijanis. At the end of the war, the Ottomans lost, but, uh, and the British came into the area, but before they lost, they uh, forced uh, the people of Karabakh to de facto temporarily accept being under control of Azerbaijan, which was a new country established in 1918 for the first time on the ruins of the uh, Russian Empire. And it was said that this would be until a peace conference uh, made agreements that would settle things and the Armenians only did it under force. So uh, as in a few more years, unfortunately, the three independent republics of Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia were very short lived and they, uh, the Azerbaijan and Armenia uh, clashed with each other and uh, there were attempts to uh, unite. The Armenians living in the mountainous areas wanted to be united with Armenia. The Azeris uh, or the people uh, the Musawat government of Azerbaijan did not want this, and uh, they opposed this with armed force, and, and among other things, in 1920, March, they uh, attacked and killed a great number of Armenians living in Shushi. This is the sort of the aftermath of it, and that depopulated part of the uh, city. Uh, in the so Soviet armies and uh, Turkic armies vied to gain control of what was left of historic Armenia, and they basically stopped uh, uh, sort of the the destruction of the Turkish nationalists who were either eth doing ethnic cleansing or continuing the killing that the Ottomans did. So a small part of Armenia came under uh, Soviet rule and that was uh, turned into Soviet Armenian state. Uh, Soviet Azerbaijan was also created and three areas, Nahichevan, Karabakh and uh, Zangezur were under uh, dispute because Azerbaijan became Soviet before Armenia. They had the edge because the Red Army was with them. The short, since I have so little time, the short version is that Nahichevan and, and Karabakh were given to Azerbaijan and Zangezur to Armenia. Nahichevan in Soviet period what, decreased from 40% to maybe 5% Armenian population and Karabakh decreased from 94, 95% to 75%. Armenians continually petitioned for uh, changing their status whenever they had an opportunity being united with Armenia, Soviet Armenia in the Soviet regime. That was never allowed. It was a tool for the Soviets to play on nationalism. Stalin probably uh, allowed, made this arrangement in 1921 in the first place to have leverage against both peoples. When the Soviet Union fell apart, uh, Armenians interpreted it as an opportunity to call for uh, not only reforms at Glasnost and Perestroika, but also ask for Karabakh to be reunited with, uh, with Armenia, since it was still a majority Armenian population. Azerbaijan opposed this. The very short version is it devolved into violence. Uh, the Soviets mishandled it, and unfortunately, it led to uh, uh, three, four years of war which ended in 1994 with a ceasefire. The majority of what you saw on that map uh, of the autonomous oblast or province in the Soviet period of Karabakh was under Armenian control. And they established what they what is called Republic of Mountainous Karabakh, which today is called Republic of Artsakh. And um, in addition, they occupied some territories which did not have Armenian population, uh, which uh, allowed a connection to Armenia. There was a sliver of territory that separated Armenia proper and Karabakh, and they uh, occupied that and some surrounding territories. Uh, there was a ceasefire, which was not very stable over the next 20, 30 years. Basically, 
the ceasefire is constantly interrupted by sniping and deaths, maybe up to 50 or 60 on, uh, from both sides. Uh, uh, the people, the our, uh, people in Azerbaijan were dissatisfied because not only did they lose control of, of uh, Karabakh, but they also lost control of uh, a number of outlying provinces, which were primarily inhabited by Azerbaijanis who did have to uh, flee those areas. The rationale that the Armenians said in holding those provinces was that it was uh, sort of a, a defense buffer and negotiations were supposed to lead to uh, some sort of resolution where some of those areas might be traded basically for recognition of the Armenian areas plus uh, connecting corridors to Armenia, but that never happened. Inertia and um, disinclination and lack of international involvement led to several more conflicts. 2016 April, there was a three or four day war, which was a, a burst, a danger sign that this could uh, lead to something bigger. Uh, Russia intervened at the very end and stopped it, but the bad feeling from it, Azerbaijan gained a little bit of territory, but not enough, and its appetite was whetted. Internal problems in Azerbaijan, declining oil prices and, and other internal problems may have uh, led to it be more looking to na a nationalist way of of solving it through through war. And finally, I'll leave the rest to Mr. Phillips, but uh, Turkey played an instigatory role in this from the very beginning, offering to be on the side of, it, of its brother state of Azerbaijan. Turkey has over 80 million population and is a NATO member with great resources. Uh, Armenia, in theory, is, part, is, I mean, not in theory, is, um, is a treaty ally with Russia, but Russia will only intervene when it suits its purpose. So. Incidents happened again in July, this time on Armenian territory that were very brief. And finally, we come to September where a full-scale war, which is very large, uh, is uh, is going on and it doesn't seem like there's any hope of intervention and it may only be solved militarily. It's a horrible thing. It's something worthy of peace action because uh, the losses on both sides are lamentable and civilians as well as, as military are involved. Hopefully thank I you, can. thank you, Armin. Yeah, very, that, very, very, uh, con, very uh, good summary of the of the situation. Okay, I'm going to turn this over now to David Phillips. David is currently director of the program on peace building and rights at Columbia University Institute for Study of Human Rights. Phillips has worked as a senior advisor to the United Nations Secretariat and as a foreign affairs expert and senior advisor to the United States Department of State. He has held positions as a visiting scholar at Harvard University Center for Middle East Studies. Executive Director of Columbia University's International Conflict Resolution Program, Director of the Program on Conflict Pre uh, Prevention and Peace Building at the American University, Associate Professor at New York University's Department of Politics, and as a Professor of Diplomatic Ac Academy at uh, Vienna. Uh, Vienna. Uh, so David, you have the uh, floor now. So Ray, you can tell from your introduction, I just can't hold a job. <laughs> no, no. Too much with too many institutions over uh, too short a period of time. But I'm very pleased to join Mass Peace Action and to be a part of the discussion tonight. I also want to compliment Arun because he gave a very concise history that spans centuries in about 25 to 30 minutes. Not an easy thing to do. It's harder to give a short speech than a long one. I'm going to try to give you a short speech. I'm going to try to extract a couple of the key elements from Aram's presentation talk a little bit about the recent conflict and recent diplomacy, trying to end uh, what increasingly looks like another Armenian genocide. Aram talked about the uh, conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan that ended in 1994. It's important to note that the UN Security Council created a mechanism called the Minsk Group, uh, which includes the countries of Russia, the US and France as the primary participants. Other countries are also a part. Turkey is a part of the Minsk group, but plays a lesser role. But the Minsk group seems to have taken responsibility for the diplomacy today. I also just want to dispel a notion that this is an internal conflict between Armenians and, and Azeris. Uh, it is meant to look that way, but it is in fact an aggression by Turkey targeting Armenians 
it is entirely consistent with Tayyip Erdogan's broader policy and objectives uh, that he's pursuing, not just in the Southern Caucasus, but elsewhere. So we shouldn't view this as a small war between Armenians and Azeris. It is potentially a much larger war. Turkey is the primary protagonist of that conflict. Uh, and the plans for what's happening now were carefully laid and executed uh, by Turkey and Azerbaijan working at its behest. Uh, in August, there were military exercises between Azerbaijan and Turkey. Instead of withdrawing its offensive military equipment, Turkey left a lot of it behind. It also left military advisors uh, and armed forces behind. Uh, we saw on September 27th an explosion of violence. Uh, this wasn't triggered by any specific incident. It was just part of a broader plan by Turkey and Azerbaijan to inflame the region. Um, what we saw in October, on September 27th, is that uh, Turkish F-16s were on the ground in Azerbaijan at an airfield in Ganja. There was also a new element that was introduced in addition to the Turkish weaponry. Turkey deployed several thousand jihadists from Syria and Libya to the front lines. Uh, these jihadists are notorious for committing war crimes uh, in northern Syria and elsewhere. Uh, Erdogan has been pursuing a neo-Ottoman agenda to reassert Turkey's influence in former Ottoman territories. Right now, we have Turkish forces that are deployed in Syria, Iraq, Libya, in Somalia. Turkey is also aggressing in the Eastern Mediterranean against Cyprus and Greece and Israel. So Erdogan is trying to establish himself as this century's sultan uh, with unmitigated powers. And the latest front of Erdogan's aggressive war making is in Nagorno-Karabakh. When the violence exploded there on September 27th, the presidents of the Minsk group countries issued a statement, essentially calling for the parties to implement a ceasefire, uh, to go back to the negotiating table, try to work out their differences through negotiations, which would be mediated by countries of the Minsk group. Uh, it wasn't Aliyev who responded to that, it was Erdogan who responded by completely dismissing the notion uh, that there should be a negotiated solution. And he's pursued an agenda, not just militarily, but diplomatically, that forecloses the possibility of negotiations uh, and emphasizes a security solution that would involve the ethnic cleansing of Armenians from the Gorno Karabakh. Uh, this ethnic cleansing is launched systematically. So I've referred to it as another Armenian genocide. Any diplomatic efforts to stop the fighting uh, have uh, so far failed. After the letters from the Minsk group chairs, we saw a series of uh, mediations. Uh, uh, 10 days ago in Moscow, uh, the foreign minister brought together the Azeri and Armenian counterparts after 10 hours of torturous negotiations, they agreed to a ceasefire. Uh, that was broken almost immediately. Uh, after Russia tried its hand, uh, President Emmanuel Macron invited uh, the parties to Paris for negotiations. Uh, there too, an agreement was reached on a humanitarian ceasefire. Uh, and it was broken almost within minutes before the ink could dry on the page. There was a resumption of bloody conflict. And then the US tried its hand. Uh, Mike Pompeo invited the foreign ministers of Armenia and Azerbaijan to come to Washington. Um, the Deputy Secretary Steve Bagan took over the mediation efforts. There was an agreement, but within moments that agreement was broken. Uh, 
In fact, Azerbaijan issued a statement blaming Armenia for breaking the ceasefire even before the ceasefire had actually gone into effect. So there's some serious question about the commitment and the sincerity of the Azeri side, which is really on the point of the spear for Turkey as Erdogan pursues his broader objectives to reassert Turkish power uh, and for Turkey to assert itself in the region, but also vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Uh, we saw in 2015, a Russian Sukhoi 24 was shot down by a, a Turkish F-16 in the airspace of Syria. There were 10 months of sanctions and bluff and bluster, uh, which ended, but uh, it was an early warning that Russia and Turkey are at odds. Uh, Turkey's economy, it was already struggling and uh, Turkey's economic performance has worsened considerably. Uh, we're now seeing the Turkish lira trade at more than seven lira to the dollar. When Tayyip Erdogan came into power after elections in 2002, it was trading at two lira to one dollar. A lot of Turkish companies took out financing based on that exchange rate. And now that the lira has crashed, they're finding it impossible to service their debt. Uh, Turkey is looking to distract the, its domestic population from the country's economic woes. Erdogan's also in trouble politically. Uh, last year, there were local elections and uh, Erdogan's Justice and Development Party lost those local elections in major uh, metropolitan areas like Ankara and Izmir. Uh, they, he also lost in Istanbul, but contested the results. So they did a, a, re, a redo, a mulligan of the election, and the AKP lost by a considerably greater margin. So Erdogan's in trouble economically, politically. Uh, I worked with Ambassador Holbrook at the State Department, and he used to say of Slobodan Milosevic that the best way to solve a problem is to create a bigger one. And that's exactly what Erdogan is doing by deploying Turkish troops to all those countries, by deploying jihadists and giving them sophisticated weapons. Uh, you know, he's essentially lit a fire. And those jihadists are the worst of the worst. Uh, they come from the Syrian National Army. Uh, they've committed atrocities, beheading uh, Syrian Kurds, uh, committing sexual violence against Kurdish women. Uh, they are guilty of war crimes and atrocities, and they should be taken to account. Instead, Turkey is paying each fighter $1,500 a month with some special benefits to their extended families. So Turkey's role here needs to be clearly understood. It's not trying to implement a peace agreement. It's not trying to work with the Minsk group. In fact, it's doing the exact opposite, fomenting conflict. Meanwhile, Turkey is challenging the authority of the Minsk group. You know, recently, we saw reports about a conversation between Putin and Erdogan, where Putin suggested that we should just solve this problem together. Uh, that's not likely to happen. In fact, we saw a couple of days ago, Russia attacked jihadists uh, in northwestern Syria, supported by Turkey. Uh, in my view, that attack was clearly intended to send a signal with ramifications in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, Erdogan has uh, attacked Macron personally uh, when the French teacher was beheaded by an Islamist. Uh, there was an uproar in France. Uh, instead of responding sympathetically to the teacher's execution, uh, Erdogan criticized Macron saying he has mental problems uh, for having raised the matter. Meanwhile, we see from Qatar to Pakistan, Muslim countries critical of France, launching boycotts of French products, all instigated by Erdogan, who feels that he can gain at Macron's loss. So let me just talk briefly about the US and then I'll pause because I'm sure that the audience has some questions. From my experience working at the UN and as a US official, the international system works best when the US is leading it. Uh, 
And we would expect in this instance for the US to step up and as a member of the Minsk group to be proactive and outspoken, particularly given the fact that another genocide is underway. But there's some serious doubts as to President Trump's motivation. We saw a report earlier this week by MSNBC documenting that the Trump organization has financial positions in 119 Turkish companies. Uh, the Trump organization was paid more than $10 million as a licensing fee to use the Trump name in the Trump Towers in Istanbul, the cost of which exceeded $400 million. We also know that uh, Trump has been paid several million dollars by Azeri oligarchs. So there's a serious question here about which we need more information. Is President Trump acting in our national interest or is he acting in his own personal financial interest? Why does he succumb to every demand that Erdogan makes? Why is the US silent in the face of this genocide that's underway? Uh, Trump has readily admitted that he has a, personally, uh, a personal debt of $431 million but we have no idea to whom that money is owed. Uh, does that money originate from Turkic sources in Turkey or Azerbaijan? Uh, and in the future, what arrangements will Trump see in order to refinance that debt? Will he turn to Erdogan or Aliyev in order to seek more funds? So with the integrity of the US seriously, seriously in question, and the slaughter intensifying in Nagorno-Karabakh, we expect international diplomacy to function. The Minsk group is agreed to by all as the vehicle for that diplomacy. But without the US taking a lead, the Minsk group isn't functioning properly. Uh, and there's some serious questions as to why the US isn't taking a lead, why we are an observer while Armenians are genocided yet again. I'll pause there and see if there are any questions. Thank you, David. Um, let, let me ask the, the first question, then we'll turn to uh, people in the audience. What, what do you see are the possible outcomes of this uh, struggle right now? Where, 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 where could it go? What, what are the various options here? So I'm not sanguine about, the, about um, the direction of this conflict. Uh, it's entirely likely that uh, Turkey is going to deploy uh, its own armed forces. In fact, Turkey's vice president made a statement earlier this week saying that if Azerbaijan asked the Turkey army to roll in, that they would stop at nothing to enforce Azerbaijan's interests. So sadly, I think the most likely um, outcome is continued conflict, uh, however brave, the Armenian forces are in Nagorno-Karabakh. They are outgunned, outmatched, outfinanced. So there's likely to be continued and intensified conflict with more Armenians being killed. We don't have a death count yet, but I think that the general consensus is that um, up to 2,000 Armenians have already died in Nagorno-Karabakh. If Turkey expands their use of F-16s, if Azerbaijan expands its use of drones that are armed, that it has secured from Turkey and also from Israel, then we're gonna see many, many more people die. Uh, is there an alternative to slaughter? Of course, there always is. Dialogue is always preferable, but we have to have dialogue which is mediated by parties that are prepared to enforce diplomacy with a credible threat of force. Uh, the Russian action against the jihadists in northwestern Syria may be an early signal that Russia is prepared to do that. But without the U.S. driving the train and actively involved, you know, I don't count on Russia to take on Turkey. There are too many commingled interests, uh, and the Armenian people will continue to pay a high price. Hey, there are um, two questions um, regarding uh, how this will play out if Biden becomes president terms of your opinion? So I don't have an opinion about that, except that you know, Joe Biden is at his core, a multilateralist and a humanitarian. 
They'll try to reactivate the Minsk group in a more meaningful way. Uh, the US will expand its humanitarian assistance. But frankly, I think Joe Biden knows that those steps, those measures are not enough. What's needed immediately is a humanitarian ceasefire, the creation of a buffer zone, separating the forces and an accountability mechanism so that forces on the ground that are committing war crimes are held accountable and the command and control structure directing them, which may go right back to Ankara is also taken to account. Those are the measures that are needed. Longer term, we have to start thinking about new constitutional or self-determination arrangements uh, for Nagorno-Karabakh. But right now there's a slaughter underway and we need to stop it. And the only way that happens is with a humanitarian ceasefire, international observers and a buffer zone. Linked to that is humanitarian action so that people are provided for and then reconstruction assistance. But that really comes in the next phase. The first phase involves measures to stop the killing and then we can look at what we do as follow up. Okay, a couple of questions that are related to each other. Um, one is, uh, what is the Azari uh, narrative? Wait a minute, if I can read this. The narrative of the cause of the conflict and the desired outcome. And uh, what is Turkey's uh, proposed solution to the conflict? So the, uh, the Azari narrative is pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, up to 20% of Azari territory was uh, taken from Baku's control with the agreement of 1994. And many ethnic Azeris were, uh, were driven from and fled their homes. Instead of resettling them and providing for them, the government of Azerbaijan has kept them in limbo as a symbol of what has happened in Nagorno-Karabakh and as a way of aggravating public opinion. So the Azeri narrative is important to consider. Uh, Nagorno-Karabakh is legally considered to be a part of Azerbaijan. Many hundreds of thousands of people, including Armenians, were driven from their homes. So uh, Aliyev has exploited those issues in order to whip up a war fervor and gain support from the Azeri public for a security and military solution. There is no such thing. It needs to be handled diplomatically. Diplomacy needs the US in the lead. Uh, if Joe Biden is elected, you can expect engagement, commitment, humanitarian action. If Donald Trump stays in power, we'll see more of the same. Kowtowing to Turkey, failing to participate in the Minsk process proactively and a blind eye to the genocide, which is underway. Hey, David, uh, I, I'm going to bring um, harm into the picture also, but I, there's one particular question I think uh, directed towards you that you may want to uh, answer. And that is, uh, can you provide sources for your charge of a genocide or slaughter of Armenians is underway? What kind of a stupid question is that? Who asked that question? No, of course there are sources. It's been reported. There are eyewitness right. accounts. There are newscasters on the line. David, I asked the question. This is Cole Harrison. Thank you for calling me stupid. I said, but I it, came it, it was a stupid I question, came here to learn, and, I, I'm, and I won't dignify it with an answer. Okay. It is well documented okay. that a genocide is underway and jihadists are involved. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, which is a credible source, uh, has made it very clear that up to 2,000 jihadists are on the ground. And Cole, frankly, I would expect from you a more mature and rational query than something right. like that. Let's uh, try to keep this uh, respectful, everybody. Um, okay. Um, so I'm, I'm respectful of the victims. It's not a matter of disrespect, Ray. It's about having a discourse which is reality-based. I, I, I'm asking for sources so that we can do that. So, and you failed to provide them. Look Thank at the you. Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. Look at the Reuters report. Look at Agence France Press. There are lots of sources, Cole. If you took the time to look for yourself, you wouldn't need to ask me. Okay. Um, next question. This could be for Arm if you want to. I answered also. Um, uh, let me see. 
Um, let's see, let's get, uh, I missed a couple back here. What, what about Iran working with Russia to end the conflict? They might be more effective than a possible US role, which might not come about. Either one of you want to take that, the role of Iran here? Iran can't really do very much in this situation because it itself is, is number one, it's sort of uh, isolated in the region and it's concerned that uh, this, what's happening in uh, Karabakh might spill over ultimately into its own territory. In fact, there were some missiles uh, from the shelling that uh, went over the other side of, of the border. When the Azeri troops approached uh, Karabakh, they did it uh, right along the, uh, the river, which is you know bordering between uh, Iran, right on the other side, hoping that uh, Armenians, that would give them kind of cover that Armenians wouldn't fire towards them perhaps. But in any case, for whatever reasons they did that, uh, Azerbaijan has always had uh, an, an eye on the northern territories of Iran, which are inhabited by uh, Iranian Azeris. This is a very complicated historical question if they're the same people, but they're Turkic and they feel an identity, whatever their histories have been with each other. The short version is Iran doesn't have the wherewithal. It kind of is a, a benevolent neutral towards Armenia by not actually joining in as a Muslim power. And it's not, it obviously doesn't want to see Turkey and Azerbaijan unite if they conquer the southern part of Armenia and Karabakh and really carry out genocide. That would mean it would be faced with a Turkic bloc and then the next threat would be its own territory. And finally, the US probably would try to, would not be averse to having some action. So I don't, unfortunately, uh, it can't, it should play a role in the area, but it doesn't probably at this point have the wherewithal to do it. Ron, can I add a piece of information to that? Sure, go ahead. Uh, Javad Zarif, who's Iran's foreign minister, I made a statement today that Iran had a peace plan in its hip pocket and it would announce that plan either tomorrow or over the weekend. We don't know any details about it. We don't know if there's any peace enforcement, but he has stated that Iran wants to get more deeply involved. Let's see what Zarif comes up with. It would be great in the first, you know, in the 90s also, there were several peace plan plans that Iran proposed. Anything would be of help. Mm -hmm. yeah, I oh, I, also, if I could just say one thing I see in the <laughs> questions, they did mention some of the resolutions in Congress. And I think there are at least two resolutions that are, being uh, spoken about. I hope it's not on tour to mention that one of them uh, basically uh, calls for uh, US uh, to support immediate ceasefire and intervention in the area. area. Another one actually calls for recognizing uh, Karabakh or Artsakh as uh, an independent republic. But again, it's the executive that uh, this can, there can be public pressure put through Congress and the legislature but we have a problem when our State Department is, is and our central government is not intervening. Let me just uh, add to that, that the uh, executive branch needs to enforce Section 907 yes, uh, of the Freedom right. Support Act, which mm, prohibits support to Azerbaijan as long as it's putting Armenians at risk. Uh, traditionally, the U.S. has been even-handed in its military and security assistance uh, to Azerbaijan and to Armenia, but recently an imbalance has arisen. Um, an additional $120 million in weapons have been provided to Azerbaijan. So the U.S. needs to freeze its weapon sales, its weapon exports. It needs to enforce Section 907. It also needs to take punitive actions against Turkey. Under the countering American sanctions, I, I, CATS is the acronym of the legislation. Turkey should have been sanctioned for its purchase of S-400 surface-to-air missiles from Russia. Trump administration hasn't taken those steps. So Washington's asleep at the switch. It needs to wake up. There are already statutes that empower Washington to do more. Let's see if Washington is prepared to do that. Okay, um, next question. Turkey is a member of NATO. To what extent does that fact affect the Russian di diplomatic and possible military actions to end the conflict? What might NATO itself do to end the conflict? Either one of you. 
So NATO's involvement would require a uh, decision by the North Atlantic Council. Uh, usually the council would act in tandem with the UN Security Council. Uh, the fact that Turkey is a NATO member is, is a complicating factor, but as I've often said in the past, if Turkey applied to join NATO today, because it is Islamist, anti-American, and an abuser of human rights within its own borders, its application wouldn't even be considered. There is no mechanism within NATO protocols to evict a member, uh, but maybe there can be a decision taken to suspend a member. Not only Turkey, but Hungary has fallen outside the bounds of what's expected. Tur NATO is much more than a security alliance. It's a coalition of countries with shared values. Do you want to make a comment to that or should I go on to the next question? No, I, I think, I mean, it's, it's things are going to change. Obviously things have changed with the European Union. And um, I have to add what's going on with France. I don't know if you're following stuff now, but um, in general, the uh, Erdogan is also inciting attacks and uh, a lot of difficulties in European countries and even possibly here, but so far in European countries where um, there are large numbers of Turkish citizens or Turkish population. There's some very frightening videos that uh, I just saw today, for example, on Twitter. So it's something that affects uh, the European Union and NATO. And, and uh, it's been a, another, pro uh, I guess another factor we haven't talked about is, is, is Israel maybe and uh, in the rest of the Middle East in this uh, situation. But NATO, I don't, didn't intervene the first time around and it doesn't seem to have the setup without leadership from a major country to do this time either. Okay. Um, just going back to um, your point, David, I just, somebody just uh, put in the chat box, Joe Biden called today for US leadership to quote, stop the advance of Az Azerbaijan troops into Nogoro Karabakh, fully enforce section 907 and end the flow of military so Biden is on record. If the U.S. is going to stop the advance of Azeri forces, that's going to require a U.N. Security Council resolution under Chapter 7, which mandates all necessary measures. Uh, the U.S. and Russia and France could co-sponsor that resolution if there's the political will to stop what's going on. Uh, we need to raise awareness about it, which is why I was pleased to accept your invitation for this evening. Uh, when a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to see it, then victims have no recourse. Just um, let's, let's bear witness. Um, just let me throw in one more question that occurred to me. In all these efforts to uh, bring about a uh, ceasefire, have they ever talked about peacekeepers being entered into the area? Because it seems to me that that's what you need is there are peacekeepers on the ground to keep the, the fighting from starting again. Well, firstly, there is no peace to keep. So in a way, peacekeeping is a, is a misnomer. Um, in my earlier remarks, I said that what's needed is a ceasefire, uh, international monitors and separation of forces. That could be done with a coalition of the willing, you know, countries who are aligned and wanna see this, the fighting stop, but it's not gonna happen on its own it's gonna require diplomatic efforts and the US needs to be a part of that. And there's absolutely no suggestion that the Trump administration has any appetite for that. I applaud Joe Biden's statement. It's a much more realistic and proactive approach. I'd add that there were also um, requests to have uh, monitors at the uh, line of contact for a number of years now. And it seems like uh, Armenia was willing to accept it, but Azerbaijan was not. And probably that's because uh, the Azerbaijan was not happy with the status quo, was rejecting the mediation efforts of, of the Minsk group and perhaps even, you know, was criticizing the Minsk group very severely. It's also hard to get anybody to intervene when you have to bring men on the ground in a conflict, which is so complex. So there's a price to pay and these powers don't seem to want to intervene and pay that price. Uh, and as we saw in Bosnia, the peacekeepers can become targets themselves. Yes. And the last thing we want is for countries to deploy peacekeepers and have them taken hostage by Azerbaijan. 
Uh, that would just inflame the situation. Right now, we're at serious risk of a regional conflict that spills over Nagorno-Karabakh's borders, potentially involving Russia, Turkey, and Iran. Before that happens, we need to step up our diplomacy, step up our game, and get more involved. Apropos, I'd like to step in here for a minute. Can you hear me? I'm an author. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, right. Uh, I've asked several times, what does this have to do with geopol geopolitics in the region and the great game for oil? There's two major uh, natural gas pipelines right north of the conflict. Um, I've written a book about this as far as I have revealed um, all these conflicts in the Middle East and the Caucasus have to do with uh, competition for oil and gas. Could you please comment on this? Aram, do you want to you want to comment? Well, certainly, obviously, oil and gas has played a major role. It's funded Azerbaijan's uh, war efforts, and it kind of gave it the hope that it would be able to amass the arms, which it did afterwards. It also is why, uh, historically, there was, uh, you know, the British came into this uh, region after World War One, and they were interested in, in Baku's uh, oil and gas. So it definitely uh, has always played a factor. The pipeline uh, agreements that carry uh, oil and gas travels uh, near enough to uh, Karabakh that it, it, it always has been something of concern and the threat of them being attacked. This is one, and also that's just one reason why uh, several of the European countries like Great Britain generally tends to have a, a pro-Azerbaijani slant. You can even see it in BBC coverage of uh, current events. Uh, it's not something new. These are a lot of these things. Kind of are we're seeing it again a hundred years later. These are national interest strategies that are still uh, that are still being events. So you're very right that uh, oil and gas are a, a key factor that are fuel, literally fueling in this case the conflict. Armenia has nothing uh, in terms of that to offer. Azerbaijan has a lot. To offer. Um, let me add that Israel gets forty percent of its oil from Azerbaijan which may explain why Israel has been providing drones to Azerbaijan. You know, in my interviews with, his, with Israeli media, I've said Israel, a country born from the Holocaust needs to be counted on the right side of history. And at a minimum, it should suspend its transfer of sophisticated weaponry, weaponry into the theater. All right, um, I think we're running out of time here. Do um, would you, either one of you uh, want to make a closing statement or if you wish or a short one or no? Um, I just say that this really is a situation which could end up in a full genocide if uh, either Turkish troops get involved or you know if at the very least if uh, Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh is actually uh, taken over by Azerbaijani troops. At the very least, we're, we're going to see ethnic cleansing. There's already tens of thousands of refugees that have gone to Armenia, placing a burden on that uh, country. But it could evolve into something really terrible. And uh, it could even, if it all it would take would be a day's intervention by Turkish troops through Nahichevan and you know, cutting through the south of Turkey and carrying out uh, a goal that they had in mind for a long time. And it could uh, unfortunately lead to, if not genocide, to why, you know, it already is in, in cl close to that situation. But that's our fear that, uh, and that's why if people do, you know, take this seriously, which they should, this would be the time to intervene, to talk to politicians, to uh, try to get some sort of action as quickly as, as possible. And the US has a lot of power on influence on Turkey. So. David? Let me add that to that, that uh, there's an opportunity here for the US and Russia to work together. Uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, we share interests. If the US and Russia teamed up, made it clear to Turkey that there is a steep price for Turkey to pay from its aggression uh, and its genocidal intentions, I think we could solve this problem quickly and efficiently, but it's not likely that the U.S. and Russia will do that. Uh, it seems that the U.S. has surrendered to Russia the field, the diplomatic field, and unless there's leadership coming from the U.S., 
uh, not only in Nagorno-Karabakh, but other parts of the world, we're going to see situations worsen and U.S. interests ill-served. Okay. Um, just one comment myself, and that is that as a member of uh, Mass Peace Action, and also Veterans for Peace, um, I see nothing good out of a war where both sides feel that they are the right and everybody else is wrong. That that it, it could it could move into uh, either ethnic cleansing or genocide if the Armenians get pushed back. So I, I think that um, my feeling is that the international community has to step in um, to end the fighting, to start negotiations again, and to keep uh, the peace on the ground. And um, hopefully being, being more informed as this uh, webinar is that other people will people will write their congressman, write the, the executive branch and try to put some pressure on the United States because the United States is still the world power and that the United States has to react. I want Wait, to can thank I just add, Let sure. me just add that a voice can be heard when people go and vote on next Tuesday. That's correct. That's the best way to have your voice heard. You know, just to say enough of the US being delinquent in its global responsibilities. Okay, I want to thank Aram and I want to thank David and also Mass Peace Action for putting this on. I think it's been informative and uh, good night to all of you. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Okay. Bye. <laughs>
or in a lot of the Middle East also. And so to me, supporting that is not the answer. There needs to be human rights for everybody in whatever state they live in and recognition of minority rights and not uh, ethnic cleansing or ethnic superiority, uh, you know, uh, in any of these regions. And, you know, Armenia is occupying right now, the only occupying power in that conflict is Armenia. Armenia is occupying not just Nagorno-Karabakh, but substantial parts of Azerbaijan territory, pre-conflict Azerbaijan territory. So, you know, there may be some justification for it, but, you know, that doesn't make it right. You know, we're not, we're not in favor of occupations in general and uh, uh, good or bad. So that's my view. It seemed like uh, this was a pretty one-sided uh, conversation and, uh, you know, not that the other side is better, but, you know, it's not like the Armenians are the innocent victims in this conflict. I don't think that's realistic. And yet it may be true that their population is, is the, are those who are most immediately at risk of being displaced or, or attacked or killed. Yeah, but like I say, you know, around Nagorno-Karabakh, if you noticed on those maps, there's a substantial amount of what was once uncontested Azerbaijani territory around Nagorno-Karabakh, which has been occupied since the 90s by Armenians, and many Azeris have fled from that region right, uh, right. Uh, so well the, the just to um the, 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 that whole period of the 90s is extremely complicated in that there were there the fighting that broke out was uh for a variety of reasons partly because there was programs of armenians in, in azerbaijan and that the the uh occupied area that you're referring to is um was partly because if you look at the map of Nagorno-Karabakh, it's indefensible unless you have those those regions. And if, if, if the Armenians been hard nosed about the negotiations, I don't think there's any question about that. But the, see, the issue is that I I believe the Armenian stance is Nagorno-Karabakh is Armenian, period, and the Azeris are saying no, it's Azeris, period, and that it belies it, it lies the problem. And how, how it's, it's nice to think that this can be settled peacefully. And I think in theory it can be, but in reality it's been extremely difficult when both sides are hard knowing about it. So anyway, I, I appreciate the uh, putting this together, Cole. And um, thank you. Well, you're, the one, you're the one to put it together. Thank you, Ray, and thank you, everyone. Okay, have a good night. Okay, good night. Good job, Ray. This is Andrea. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah, that was very good. Well.